podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 102. I can't believe we're this far ahead now. Um, And this one is all about how to confront clients. That's an interesting title, Jackie. It is. I don't like confrontation, Bob. I never have. Okay. So we change the... Let's reframe the word confrontation to challenge. Okay. I mean, no, you can use confrontation, but I think when I think of confrontation, I think that perhaps like a, I know it's a psychoanalytical word when you talk about things, when we talk about things, but I prefer the word challenge because I think it has a softer sort of um, feeling to it. Yeah. So when you talk about confrontation, I tend to think of challenge. So how do we confront stroke challenge in psychotherapy? Well, it's an interesting one because if we go back to the contract, now I'm not sure if you do this, so it'll be a good, uh, I'll enjoy asking if you do. But um, as you know, contracts is pretty central to TA um, from an adult to adult perspective. So when somebody comes into therapy with me, in the contracting stage, I usually will say, how are you in terms of me challenging you if I feel you're sabotaging yourself or some of your goals and aims um, are scripty? Okay, I don't do that. No, so usually I get some sort of permission yeah. in the process so that they are... Well, not the more and more they're ready for that, but they also agree from that, from an adult place. So it means that in the challenging, if somehow they, I don't know, they act out, I can say, well, do you remember at the beginning we were talking about in psychotherapy sometimes? Yeah. There's a necessity to challenge if I see the therapy going away, which is sabotaging your health or not what you want. Yeah. Which is a very good point. Yeah, maybe I should do that. One of the things I do say to clients is, um, how will I know if you're angry with me? Which is kind of along the same lines. Do you know what I mean? What what will I see if you're angry? So are you linking linking anger with challenge then? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're linking things like irritation, and frustration um, to the impact of confrontation and challenge from you then? Yes. If I've questioned them or if I've, you know, done something to upset them, I would imagine that is a challenge or a confrontation in some way and they would have a response or a reaction to that. Okay. Okay. So we sort of, it's in the same ballpark. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So uh, I always do that. So they... Because I see, I think part of psychotherapy will demand challenge. Yeah. Because if that wasn't there, it's almost like, why do they come to therapy in a way? Yeah, because when when they're, you know, stepping out of the comfort zone, it is going to be a challenge. It is going to be difficult for them. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I always get that sort of contract. And, um, you know... The other thing about really to bear in mind around challenging with clients <coughs> is the several tips. Number one, I think, is you spend some time hearing their story first. Okay. It reminds me of a book that somebody lent to me when I went on holiday recently. And it was written by, and I can't remember her name, but it was written by a forensic psychotherapist and she worked with um, people who really were either murderers, serial killers, um, people who really um, were inverted commas, had (coughs) real times in their lives. 
So she was working with those characters. Um, and she said quite frequently, which was heartening for me to hear, because I, I come from the same framework in terms of therapeutic technique, is that you really need to hear their story first, not only out of curiosity, respect and integrity, but as important to build up a relationship where there's some aspect of trust. Yeah. Before you do anything else. Yeah. And I suppose knowing their story and how how conflict or challenges were dealt with when they were growing up is also going to be helpful because for some people, you know, being challenged isn't that bad of a thing, whereas for others it can be a really, you know, difficult thing to cope with. Mm. To be questioned or 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 anything like that can be uncomfortable. Oh, that's right. In TA, they call that process script analysis. Yeah. Where you're looking at how the script was started, formed, formulated and ended, if you like, or yeah. still ongoing. Either way, I think build up a working relationship is so important when we talk about the timing of challenge. Now, you are correct um, in terms of how a person yeah, takes challenge. I often think in terms of personality adaptations or personality theories. So, for example, somebody who comes from a narcissistic place yeah. a lot of find challenge more difficult than perhaps some other personality profiles because they'll feel or could feel narcissistically wounded by any any challenge against what they say, for example. Yeah. So I think the different personality adaptations or disorders often are a guide to perhaps how a therapist uh, will challenge or seek to challenge somebody when they are perhaps acting out destructive behaviours or acting out processes, which means that their goal or their contracts will be achieved. Um, so I do think that's important to think of their personality formulations. Yeah. And even, you know, people pleasers, you know, <laughs> like me, I'm a people pleaser, you know, so for, for me to be challenged or, you know, confronted in my mind means that I've not got it right. Something's wrong and that, you know, impacts on me because I'm a people pleaser or the try hard, do you know what I mean? When we're, we're trying to, yeah, just make everything into a Chinese puzzle. So there's lots of different things that play out when there is a challenge or a confrontation that needs to take place. Yes, you're correct. And it's not that therapists are not in the game of challenging people. In fact, I'll go back to my first statement at the beginning of this podcast, and that is, I think if a therapist doesn't challenge a person when they are sabotaging their healthy goals or they yeah. continue their destructive behaviours, then the therapist isn't doing their job. It's not that you wouldn't have therapy without, you know, there's always be challenge in a therapeutic process. So that's the, that's taken as read. It's how you do it. Yeah. And number one, I think, as I said, is building a working relationship, hearing their story. Now, you can be thinking of, like you've just said, personality adaptations, personality formulations, and how you might, a process of how you might build up to challenge the person in front of you. So it's how you do it, not, you know. Uh, Whether you do it or not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the question. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> so I, I said, build up a working relationship, get trust, do script analysis. Build, building up a working relationship is so important in terms of trust and having the fertile ground, which enables you to make the tentative challenges you're going to make. Another really, really crucial bit about the whole process of challenge in psychotherapeutic process is the idea of timing. In other words, when you do it. Yeah. That's almost 
as important as building up a relationship is the timing of the confrontation stroke challenge. That is absolutely important. Timing as in when in the therapeutic process do you start to challenge? Well, yes, I mean, there's different types of challenges, aren't there? When you say start to make a challenge, I was thinking, oh, there's different types of challenges, sort of like um, a continuum of health. You can you can challenge in a way which might the other person might perceive as a very abrupt or feel they're being demeaned or whatever way you want to look at this. Um, so start, yeah, if you want to put it that way, starting the challenging process, yes. Now the timing comes very, very crucial. Number one, again, it needs to be when trust has, trust has been established. Without yeah. trust, you won't go anywhere. Has to be when the working relationship has been established. And I think it has to be, and this is, a, I think, a fourth tip now, and it's a TA words again, so forgive me, people who perhaps don't know TA that well. It is when the child trusts you, not the adult, not the parent, but the child, the younger self, needs to feel safe with you before they can tolerate challenge, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it, I'm, I'm thinking back now at the times where maybe I have challenged um, clients, that that child, you know, the way that it responds and reacts to that is is interesting because I've had clients that kind of go into that rebellious younger self where they kind of get the hump with me. <laughs> And then there's also the one where, you know, the, the more adaptive and apologetic when, you know, that's happened in a session. Which probably is the flip side of the adaptive child, you know, the compliant child on one side and maybe the angry or even the free child on the other side. But it's, it's definitely the younger self. If you've got the younger self on board mm. in terms of, them feeling safe with you, regardless of whether they become compliant or or whatever, you've got a chance of the 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 um, timing of the challenge being received in a way which the other person can tolerate, not only hearing you, but reflecting on what you said. Yeah. Yeah, without thinking it's a judgment or a criticism. That's yeah. The yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. If you're going to make a challenge about their destructive behaviours or the way they're acting out or the fact they're going, um, they that they're still keeping to their script or, or whatever it is, then they have to be able to hear that in a way that you're on their side and not against you. Yeah. Which is why the word challenge is is a lot nicer than, you know, conflict or confrontation. Yeah. It's a softer word. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. And I think, uh, and again, I, I was reading this book on yesterday, this is why I remember it, and she was talking about, the author was talking about another person <laughs> she was working with who was um, quite damaged, and she had to spend quite a long time building up a working relationship before she could even, um, or how the receiver could tolerate her even speaking to him in the first place. So I think timing really is crucial in terms of the continuation of trust, the establishment of safety and the younger self believing or feeling safe that the therapist is on their side yeah so what once we've done that once we've given it time and do you know what I mean with the relationships formed and all those sorts of things what if it's taken the wrong way what if well let me just carry on yeah I've got some good questions I'll get back to I just want to just carry on a moment and talk about a concept in TA called 
uh, strokes, which is a unit of recognition. Um, and even more specifically, what is called a bullseye stroke or a bullseye yeah. transaction. And that's where the trans transaction hits all three ego states at the same time. Yeah. In other words, it's accepted by the parent, heard by the adult, and believed by the child. So it's a really important transaction. And it usually will provide reflection and insight by the other person. Yeah. I just wanted to say that because that bullseye transaction is usually um, only really possible after a working relationship and time is spent. Now, in answer to your other question is, which I think I'm from hearing this right, what happens if the receiver, that's the client, either doesn't hear the transaction or the timing is inaccurate or the timing isn't the way that the therapist hoped it would be or the client acted out in some way? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would actually say usually that's a mistake of delivery by the therapist or a mistake in timing by the therapist. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we did a podcast not long ago, I think, on mistakes in psychotherapy, I believe. I yes. don't know. Yeah, yeah. They can be immensely valuable. Yeah, and can be something a therapist can really use only if the client feels safe enough to tolerate the mistake. In other words, the client feels, okay, uh, that was a mistake or that was wrong or you hurt me here or this was said at the wrong time or whatever it is. But they can allow that to be part of the process if a working relationship has been established and trust has been established and the client at some level knows the therapist is on their side even if they got it wrong this time yeah and then of course the therapist needs to take ownership of the mistake and say something like oh were you not ready to hear that at that moment or did you feel overwhelmed or was it the wrong time for me to perhaps have said this or uh, was reflection of what I've said so painful and maybe we can come back to that. So they take ownership. Yeah. Um, the, it's another psychological term, can be seen as a relational term in therapy. They take ownership of the misattunement because if the therapist is attuned to the client, then mistakes are going to be less frequent. Yeah. Especially in delivery of transactions. Yeah, absolutely. But you, th there are some clients that I, I can think of that potentially wouldn't even let me know that I have upset them or the timing wasn't right. Do you know what I mean? Because, yeah, they, they wouldn't bring it up. They might just disappear. They might just not come back again. <laughs> or what? Or if they stayed with you, what might they do instead? I'm not sure what you mean. Okay, so for you to have said that, you must have some thinking about either previous clients or even a hypothesis that you wouldn't know, I think that's what you said, if the time had been inaccurate or that they were hurt or there was some mistake in delivery, that they would... That they would either adapt or go away or something else would happen. And I was thinking, well, I wonder what would happen then if you didn't know they were hurt <clears throat> or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more that they would know that they were hurt, but they wouldn't bring it up with me. They wouldn't say anything. And then what would you do? Well, hopefully I'd notice a change in behaviour. There'd be a disconnect there and I would notice, do you know what I mean, that disconnection between the two of us. And let's follow this through. And then what you might you do when you see the disconnection? Question them. Have I have I said something that's upset you? Yeah, you'd account yeah. or take ownership 
of what happened. Yeah. That's what I meant earlier on. So you take ownership and account for the misattunement, for the transactions, for the hurt, or even you would take account by querying or asking questions or reflecting. But what I expect you wouldn't do is let it just pass. You wouldn't no. just let the moment pass. You'd probably inquire, even if it was by asking questions or reflections. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. If you were given the opportunity, I was thinking that, the, you know, there might be some some clients who, who don't give you the opportunity. They kind of, after that session, they just leave because, you know, what you've done has hurt them in, in challenging them and it's not what they wanted to hear. Because it's difficult for some clients, but in order to make change, we need to take action. And that sometimes can be difficult <laughs> So yeah. for me, challenging a client is, is part of that taking action, action or making a change, and that in itself can be quite challenging. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. So let's just follow what you just said about somebody who withdraws or leaves. Yeah? Yeah. Well, if that happens, I mean, we have talked in earlier podcasts, but let's just take through what you're talking about here. If that happens, what usually happens then there's many options for the therapist now knowing you i don't think the option i'm going to say he, he, next you would take but i'm going to say it because this is one of the options you could just say oh well it was too much for them um goodbye and that would be that yeah now, i don't think you take that one i no. think no. i think you would think about this you would reflect on what's been happening in therapy and you'd find some way to complete the process and take account, even if it's only a way of finding a way to say goodbye. Exactly, yeah. To have an appropriate ending, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that is taking account of the process. Now, yeah. usually, if you take account of the process, even if somebody is to leave, so you phone them up, or you to leave a voicemail, or send them a text, or in the days of social media, you can do many other things. If you take account, take ownership, and also remind them of the contract they had at the beginning, which was with you to have permissions to challenge them if you see some behaviours which is uh, unhealthy, like withdrawing or passive behaviours or whatever it is, by reminding them, they will feel accounted for. Yeah, absolutely. And from that, you may get a completely different beginning in therapy. Yeah. I think it, yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. But I think it opens up a whole new area for discussion. That, that you know, be, being challenged and bringing that back into the room and how that made them feel. And, you know, did you feel like you were being criticized or judged? Or, you know, did you understand that it was coming from a, a well meaning, loving place and, and just, yeah, opening up a whole different conversation? Yeah, staying in relational dialogue. Yeah. Now, sometimes you are correct. They're so uncomfortable, the challenge or the, the reflection or taking ownership of their own scripted behaviours, that they may, for the moment, withdraw. Usually when people don't come back, as I said, if you take account of the process, I'm thinking one client here particularly, and invite them back to discuss what has happened in the process and remind them of the contract you had at the beginning around challenge and everything else. Mostly, if you've got a working relationship with them, which is good, and they know that you're on their side, they often will come back. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I think the only time, really, where I've had to challenge a client... I want to say quite strongly is when a client's broken our contract, which I felt really, really uncomfortable about doing because it's only ever happened once and it was in the early days. And I took it to supervision because I really didn't know what to do because they'd broken the contract. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And the bit was you cared about them enough to take them to supervision. Yeah. You didn't just 
wash your hands of them? No. It's true. So, so I think this goes back to something I would give to the podcast listeners as a tip is to put in their contracting procedures, if they do contracting procedures, uh, and to talk about one of the duties, if you like to use that word, or one of the roles, if you want to use that word, of a psychotherapist, is to challenge a person mm. if you see them moving towards unhealthy patterns or destructive behaviours or keeping a script on the road which isn't healthy for them. Yeah. Because you've always got somewhere to go back to. Yeah. Because you just saying that then quite succinctly or whatever, it is part of our duty to challenge the clients, really. It's, it's... Otherwise, we're not doing our job, dear. We really aren't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In fact, we're doing, we are doing something far more unhealthy which is to collude with a unhealthy script or destructive behaviour, which will mean usually a repetitive cycle and uh, the client will just continue in that process and repeat history. Yeah, absolutely. They're paying us to, to challenge them. How, that's not the question for me. That's why I put it in the contract. It's how we do it. Yeah. I, I said three well, three things. One, build up a working relationship. Two, make sure the child feels safe with you. Uh, three, are safe enough to tolerate mistakes or misattunements. And thirdly, and I think this does need to go here, is that you challenge gently. Yes. Not from a parent position. Yeah. Or if it does come from a parent position, you need to be fairly safe with the process that the person's going to hear it's from a positive parent setting boundaries or whatever it is. Yeah. And and not to repeat history for them, where they feel judged, demeaned, put down, dismissed, whatever which ways we want to put this. Yeah. Which is possible. We can, we can come from a parent's place without it, you know, coming across as being condescending or judgmental or or any of that sort of stuff. It can be done in a nurturing way. Well, I think we have to, if we're talking about setting boundaries, helping with emotional regulation, um, helping with, um, helping the person have a place to reflect on what's happening in the process, we often have to come from a positive, you know, nurturing, if you want to put it that way, parent. Mm. Now, I think what you're hitting on, you said it earlier on in the same sort of ballpark again, which is that maybe what you do, but the client still hears it negatively. Yeah. Because that's their history. Yeah. The question is what you do then. Now you can do many things. One of them is say, you know, I, mean, I was thinking, are, are you hearing this as negative against you or are you hearing this judgmentally? And if you are, who in your history spoke to you in this way? Mm. Negatively, with dismissing and demeaning you because this is not my intention. Yeah. So this would be really unusual for you to hear. So let's just discuss this for a moment. Yeah. It's not that we we need to come to parent because quite often they haven't had a dependable, consistent, protective parent looking out for them. So it's very unusual for them. They're in an alien world. They've had the opposite usually, the yeah. toxic narrative. So it's it takes a while for them to find a new calibration, if you like. Yeah. And, so they can respond in a different way. Yeah, and I agree with what you said, you know, that it's kind of unusual for, for some clients in a, a therapy situation to, to be challenged because they, they kind of, I don't know, somehow 
think that you're always on their side and you're not going to pick them up on anything, even if you see it as being detrimental to moving forward or, you know, their well-being or anything. It's like, it, yeah, it can be disruptive in the relationship somehow. If you have a sniff of them redefining and hearing the negative parent rather than your positive parent, you need to reflect and think, am I yeah. coming positive parent position in my voice tone my uh, inquiry my you know you have to think about that but if that is all lining up for you then you need to inquire with the other person what they're actually hearing yeah how does that fit in their history because it's not my intent to fit into your history in fact it's my intent to provide you a different experience so you then have a space for relational dialogue. Yeah. Now, that leads us on to another thing. Sometimes the positive parent, which I'm talking about here, which is often nurturing, though quite firm, often accounting, and all the things I've just been talking about, may be too painful for the person to hear because it reminds them of what they didn't have. Mm. And then they might act out in a different way and push you away. But the job of the therapist then is to, a bit like a terrier, if you want to look at it this way, is to make every inquiries. I hear that you seem to be withdrawing or you perhaps even feel a bit angry. Could you tell me a little bit about what's going on for you at the moment when I'm reacting to you this way? Yeah. So you search their subjective experience rather than assuming something yes that's the danger without the inquiry is that we do well i do make assumptions yeah so it is important to inquire and i think yeah, that's a really good point that you're saying you know the fact that they can reflect on something and the feelings that they didn't get from their parents and that that in itself can be quite upsetting yeah absolutely and often is and it's the and a mistake, if we would have put mistake in inverted covers here by the therapist, would be if they stop there mm. without inquiring the extra step. And what's happening inside? Yeah. What's happening for you as I'm talking to you this way? You feel overwhelmed or I see that you've moved back a step or you seem quite X and it's happening for you. So your voice goes down a bit. There's an increase of nurturing process. If they're so overwhelmed, they'll step back even more. Yeah. You need to inquire about what's going on for them, not assume. Yeah. And this for me is the beauty about therapy because we you know in a session we we get sidetracked or you know we have to take a side step to work on something that's come up in the session not necessarily about the topic but the reaction or the relationship in the room do you know what's most important jackie what? it's not the content of the session yeah it's the process of the session yeah it's what's happening in the process between two people not necessarily the content I'm not saying the content's not important, but what I am saying, what is far more important in my professional opinion, is the process and what's underneath the content. Absolutely. But we do get caught up in the content sometimes. Yes, yes especially, you know... Often in the if, early days, I did, yeah. Yeah, and often if we're contract-driven, because, <laughs> you know, it's important that we have contracts and goals and... We, I think it's important to put that in the therapy car park, if you like. That's a phrase of mine, therapy car park. I love that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's more important is the process beneath the contracts. Yeah. But you are right. We, if you know, And if we do do that, and it's very, very straightforward, lots of therapists do that. If we do get so caught up on the content or focus-driven in... The achievement of contracts we can miss the process mm. and i think the process if we stay with the process 
we get there in a much we get there in the end and we also get there in a much more subject we get there taking account of the client's subjective history yeah rather than our own assumptions absolutely and with a much more robust resilient client mm. at the end of the day as well it, it yeah i absolutely so it's not that we aren't in the game of not making you know challenges or confrontations it's it's how we do it and what we do next and what we do next usually especially if, the, if there's misattunements we take accounting of those misattunements and we inquire what's happening with the other people yeah the other people I mean, and their subjective experience yeah with yeah. that the building up of the working relationship and the therapeutic process means they're much more likely to be able to reflect, have the space, the relational dialogue to look at what is being put forward in terms of a challenge, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. I really enjoyed this, Bob. Thank you. It's an interesting subject, isn't it? It is, it is. And again, it, you know, the, the process of it all and the different layers and everything. It's, yeah, this is why I love my job. Well, can I just wait one other point? You certainly uh, can. Hey, yeah, yeah. Again, it's for transaction analysts. Well, it's for anybody listening, of course, but I'm using the TA model again. And I think you talked about timing early on. I talked the importance of timing. I talked about bullseye transactions. I think it's important to think about which ego state or part of the self the challenge is aimed at. Now, if you make the challenge to the parent part of the self, you risk competition. Mm. In other words, you risk the parent part going into competition with the parent part or what they perceive as the parent part of the uh, therapist yeah absolutely I yeah say that because it's really easy very easy and very almost commonplace for therapists it if the challenge is made to the parent part of the client to go into the troubled waters of competition or at least to invite competition by the dysfunctional parent. Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is that the challenge needs to be aimed <clears throat> at the child ego state or the younger part of the client. Yeah. That's the last thing I wanted to say in the podcast, but a very important part because it's I've seen it many, 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 many times in supervision when therapists get caught up with parental battles when they challenge the parent. <clears throat> you need to bypass the parent to get to the child ego state where they feel safe enough to reflect about their younger self in the surface of that relational dialogue. Yeah, because I see that part of it is getting into the playing games bit if you do do that there's a danger of getting into during the parent competition yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely definitely another way of the, to look at that of course is the carbon triangle so if you get caught up in that sort of persecutor rescue of business which comes usually from the parent um you you go around that triangle and repetitive processes or you need to keep up all that lot yeah, and one of the best ways is to head towards the ch vulnerable child yeah. brilliant okay to stop i just wanted to say that last bit and and it was a very important bit too sable so until next time where we'll be talking about how to promote resilience in the therapy process well, which i think it's... follows on from this quite well it does. Uh, it does. And I thought about that when you mentioned the word earlier on, you were talking about resilience. And it does 
does really, really follow on from this. So I look forward next week talking about that. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Until next time, Bob. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.